Hello everybody, James here, story time with Dutch Mantel, episode 55, and uh, I'm doing quite a good run of actually getting the number right here. Right, let's do some plugs first and then we'll get straight into the meat of it, and goodness me, we've got a lot to talk about this week as well. So, first off, we've got t-shirts, brand new t-shirts. The old one, you people mean nothing to me, the Continental Classic. The new one, I've lost it, but it's uh, respect the stash. Just imagine me holding the t-shirt up and then, you know, you'll probably see it. Respect that moustache, let me tell you, you should do. Uh, We have books as well, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. If you want them on Amazon Unsigned, that's where you go. If you want them signed, you go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. And if you want two of my books as well, I've only got two, so that's what you're stuck with. Owen Hart, King of Pranks, and Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, two of the finest biographies (laughs) you will ever... Excuse me, I'm catching your cough now, Dutch. Two of the finest biographies you'll ever, ever see. And the only other thing to do is say, please give us five stars on iTunes. We have actually surpassed 100 uh, reviews now, but I just, you know, give us more, I suppose. How are you, Dutch? Good. How were the reviews? We are 4.9 out of 5 on iTunes, which is very good. Really? Yes. Oh, that is good. Mm. And also, you know, what we do here is... Upset people. You ask questions. (laughs) You ask questions... I give answers. And this is how I learned the wrestling business. I would drive or sit in the back seat while the veterans drove, and I listened. And it's amazing what you can learn by just listening. Because I didn't have the nerve to ask any questions. I just listened. And I, I, I learned so much just for sitting back there or on the back. They would put me behind the wheel because they would be drinking. And I would drive, and I would I would still listen, and I heard oh some great stories, and it made the time fly by. We'd be on a two hundred and fifty mile trip, but if the conversation was good, and you enjoyed being with the people that I was, because I enjoyed being with the people that I was with, because or they enjoyed me, because if they didn't like me, I wouldn't be with them. But but I, I learned so much, so. And that's why I ended up writing my two books. I wrote those old stories down. And one day I was in Puerto Rico. I said, I'm going to write a book just like that. So I went out on the beach and I wrote the first book, uh, The World According to Dutch, in five weeks on the beach in Puerto Rico. And I've told this story before and I would take some rum down there with me and I would think about the story all day long. And Senor Rum was very, very good at telling stories too. I didn't know that. And uh, then about four o'clock when the sun was starting to weaken, I would go back to my apartment, turn that air on low. And I just I had to write the stories that I'd been thinking about that day. And it took me about five weeks and I had uh, I had some help in, in Nashville where I was living then. And uh, and uh, another town in, in Tennessee. And I, I sent my stuff to them. They helped me correct it, punctuate it, correct the spellings, you know, the g- grammatical errors, which they were many. And then I came out with it. And it and I, I thought the other day I was trying to figure up how many books have I really sold? And I have I figured it up over a period of, uh, I say, 10 years. 12 years, I probably sold 10,000. Really? And well, yeah, for for a, a, not an anonymous writer, but a writer doing it on his own, I thought 10,000 books was was actually quite an accomplishment. Yeah, definitely. And the way, and, and, and if anybody is, uh, this is some more advice, this is part of the University of Dutch program, which, by the way, You can get a diploma to if you want to be a graduate of the University of Dutch. You just write me at dirtydutchmantel at gmail.com and and mantels with two L's and ask for details on it. I think it's about $45 and I pay the shipping and I put your name on it in a beautiful, beautiful diploma. Even if I say so myself, I (laughs) I designed it. But uh, that's how I learned the wrestling business. So, and I had another thing I was going to say. 
I was going to, I've been hit in the head a couple of hundred thousand times, was, but anyway. I was going to ask you, because you're famous for not driving, so when did you sort of like morph into the driver, into the uh, as present soon passenger? As I, no, as soon as I got out of rookie status, I tried to move my driver designation over. But then I thought, wait a minute, I'm driving from <clears throat> Memphis on a Monday night, we're tired. And I'm letting some guy drive me. Hell, I might not even know him, really. It could be a, he could have been new to the territory. So I'm putting my life in his hands. We're going down Interstate 40, back to Nashville. It's about 220 miles. It's all interstate. It's okay. And I'm thinking, wow, that's uh, I'm putting my trust in somebody I, I don't even know. But anyway, I, I didn't like to drive. Hated to drive, and and it's a wonder. And I thought this for, for forever. It's a wonder that more wrestlers haven't been killed in car accidents than what they have been, mm-hmm. because the number of miles they drive. You know, they they actually in some places wrestlers drove more than truck drivers. In Mid-South, which is Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and part of Mississippi, and damn, you would drive 25, but you wouldn't drive 2,500, but you would travel by car about 2,500 miles a week. Some of those trips that Bill Watts would book you on, they were like, I don't know, 300 miles one way. So if you, if you take regular people and they make a trip and they end up going 300 miles, well, by the time they get there, they're wore out. But do wrestlers have time to rest? Hell no. You go in the dressing room, you put your gear on, you wait to your place in the lineup comes up. Then you go to the ring and then you physically work or perform 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, you come back, take a shower, you're back in the car 300 miles back. So some people must have, um, you know, you say like, so wonder how more people weren't killed or crash cars or whatever, but I wonder what percentage of people fell asleep at the wheel, even for a second and woke back up. It oh, happened had a to crash. me. Oh, really? No, it happened to me. Oh, yeah. I was coming from Memphis one night, and I was so tired, and I was by myself. And that's why you need somebody with you that can watch you, and if you're not up, they, if they're awake too, hell, they could be asleep too. But, you know, I, I hit my my tires, hit the, off the pavement, and I was into the rough. And I looked ahead, and there was two double bridges so if I'd have went right down between those bridges, I would have sailed off right into the Tennessee River. And old Dutchie would have been gone. But now the, the good thing about that is when you get shocked like that, you do wake up. Mm. That adrenaline does start flowing. And you will stop at the next place that serves coffee. And you will get coffee. Mm. Very seldom have I pulled over and went to sleep. I have before. I would stop at rest areas and, I'll, and uh, take it take about an hour or two. I'll, I'll ask this and very rest, quickly. Rest areas is another weird place to be <laughs> because if you're sitting there and you know you look like you're asleep and you see all those people going in and out and coming in and this and that and you're wondering what the hell are all of them? I know all of them aren't using the bathroom. There's a lot of drug transactions going on. There was a lot of, there were a lot of actually prostitutes working the the rest stop outside the 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 rest area there, and you know you think it's a pretty safe place, but it can be and it can't be. Hmm. But anyway, I've talked enough about that. So, well, well, I've never asked you this: which was the territory with the uh, easiest road schedule? Like, like the, the let's say you worked at least six days a week and you travelled the shortest amount between towns. Well, they had a territory one time called Knoxville, 
run by Ron Fuller. If he had a hundred mile trip, that was a long trip and did tremendous business. Ron Fuller is a name that doesn't get its true uh, worth in the wrestling business. Very smart guy. He's about 6'11". So when you're talking to him, you're, you're looking up <laughs> like that. And oh, he's, he's funny as hell and good businessman. And he was smart. Let me tell you how smart he was. When he saw the WWF, when they were expanding and taking all uh, taking over all what I call the mom and pops territories, taking over Florida and taking over Alabama and, and in Texas and Memphis and all those territories that have had, had stood for so long and did such good business. Ron saw that coming. And he said, it was only a matter of time before they kill me here. And he's not saying by actually coming in and drawing, it was like people watching their TV show. So he found a, I call a Mark. He found a guy who wanted, who owned a TV station in Montgomery, Alabama, and sold the whole territory to him. So he unloaded it, made a ton of money on it, and he ended up buying. Guess what he bought with the money? Now, I think, um, is it a hockey team? A minor league yeah. hockey team. I think somewhere. I think he started in Ohio, some AAA team. Not a, not a. I don't know if that's the lowest or the highest. No, I think but AAA I is the highest, so it'd be like a double. Okay. Or single a. Well, he started with a with an A team, but then he ended up bringing it to Nashville, and now they have a major league franchise there called the Nashville Predators. That I think they won the. What is the championship called? Some kind of cup, golden Stan cup. Stanley Cup. I know that's one. Stanley Stanley Cup. How come you know more about American hockey than I do? I don't. That's like my I... one fact. And also, oh. and this is why I never write. So I never went to go see hockey because I never like to wear my glasses in public or anywhere because they're just annoying. And the puck is so small that basically I'd just be looking at floor, like because like all the white over it would just like engulf the small. I would just it'd just be people running back and forth for me. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, when you watch the NHL now, what Ron Fuller brought to the NHL was the wrestling introductions. He would turn the lights down low and he'd start those, those search lights going, ladies and gentlemen, please, starting at left forward or whatever, from and he would have the announcer, and then they'd put the spotlight on the guy, and he would go out. And he gave that, and at at one point, NHL sent him a letter and told him they wanted him to stop this. They said it demeans the sport of uh, pro hockey. It demeans the sport. And he says, well, I'm not going to do it. He says, well, we're going to investigate this further. And they ended up sending – two representatives to Nashville to meet with Ron. And uh, they came, met with him. And they're going to watch, they're going to watch the, uh, the game. And, you know, they have, this is hockey that screws me up. They have three intermissions. I mean, mm. they have, you take an intermission after the first quarter, I guess, third, second quarter. On the I don't know, but they, yeah. But they have two in a game set of one. They have two. Yeah, yeah. But in those intermissions, Ron Fuller filled it in. He filled it in with uh, – he would get a a car dealer in Nashville, and they had a contest that says if you can, can be at one goal and shoot a puck the length of the rink – and go let it go through a hole about this big, you'll win a brand new car. And that wasn't Ron's idea. That was the dealership's idea because they got all that free advertising that if you make this shot, you get a, I forgot what year was it, and I think it was in the, the 90s. 
Pinto. You get a brand new 1998 Cadillac DeVille, which was a state of the art Cadillac at the time, I guess. And Ron told me one time, he said, I asked them, how can you guys afford this? They said, brother, please. <laughs> It more than pays for itself. We are, and he would have during that intermission that nothing was going on. He would put it in with commercials, which what I thought was was genius. But when I saw it, I did go to a couple of games. He would he'd invite me down. I'd go, and but I didn't know. I thought everybody did it. I didn't know the NHL didn't do it. And the two representatives that the NHL sent to talk to Ron, they came back and their their uh, demeanor and attitude had completely changed. They were saying, damn, this is a hell of an idea. We're going to take this back. And they did. And the NHL adopted it. <laughs> but it started with Ron Fuller. He bought, he bought the franchise, the first one. I think for like either fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars, but he ended up making this is minor league. He ended up making I don't know a couple of million dollars on it that year because they don't pay they don't pay uh, minor league hockey players nothing hmm. like major, uh, minor league baseball players. They don't pay them nothing. They pay them about even now they pay them four, five, six hundred dollars a week. That's what they pay them. <laughs> that's actually below minimum wage talking about the time they spend in uh, they spend practicing the game and traveling to the games and but but Ron Fuller probably had the territory with the least amount of miles and the most fun <laughs> so he was he was a really good guy I we will. need to have him we need to have him on here yeah definitely right I've always now said that Robert I've been, as well now now that I've introduced him, have you interviewed him? Never. We'd negotiated at one point to have him on, and then it just sort of just went nowhere, <laughs> I think. I mean, uh, yeah, he's yeah. a good guy, really good guy. Yeah. And can he talk? And he was a great, great booker. Mm. And of course, that leads me into another area. Where did he learn booking? He learned it from his father, Buddy Fuller, who was actually one of the forefathers of Tennessee wrestling. He learned it from him. And then he learned it from, uh, from Eddie Graham. So he got all of his booking knowledge from those two people. See, Ron, he was six eleven. He was, he was a basketball player and he played college basketball. And he came to my attention way before I got into wrestling because Clemson is my favorite college football team, <laughs> I guess basketball team too, if you're playing somebody. But that's where he went to school to play basketball. He went to Clemson. But then he, tra and, uh, uh, he transferred to the University of Miami. And I asked him one time, I said, why did you go to Miami from Clemson? He said, you ever been to Clemson? I said, well, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> excuse my coffee. Unfortunately, I grew up about 15 miles from there. He says, well, You've been to Miami, right? I said, yeah. He said, any more questions? I said, no. <laughs> You've answered yourself. But anyway, let's get on with the show. Don't get me started on any of this other stuff because. But anyway, oh, oh yeah. If you want a university, that's what I, I just remember what I was going to say. If you want a university of dust diploma, write me Dirty Dutch Ventail with two L's at gmail.com and I'll get back to you. I've just realized when you were speaking then that I totally forgot to watch Dark Side of the Ring. We'll do a Dark Side of the Ring another time uh, with Eddie and Mike Graham. But then there'll be another Dark Side of the Ring we'll have to watch anyway. But Well, the thing about that is I was in Florida when Eddie killed himself. Yep, yep. We've, uh, yeah. I was booking it. And I wrote a story about it in one of the books. I can't remember which one. But that is that is a hard because I really liked Eddie. He had like a mentor's effect on you. And when you ask him a question, and this is what I think mentors should do in any business, is when one of their uh, underlings or one of, the, one of the people with not as much status as a booker 
when somebody asks you a question out of professional courtesy, you should stop and answer it if you have time. And that's what road trips are for. And that's how I used to I used to learn booking because I would ride with uh, I would ride with Ron, who was a great booker. I would ride with Jerry Jarrett, who was a great booker. I would ride with Tom Renesto, who was one of the world famous assassins tag team. And they would tell me all this booking knowledge that I would have never, never gotten if I hadn't talked to those guys. And I talked to them in a in an environment that was relaxing and was laid back and I could ask questions and, and they would answer them. But that, that's how, that's how you learn. And that's how I learned. Who was, so. your, who was your absolute favorite booker? Well, what, what, I think, let, let me qualify this. Not like just to talk to, but who do you, I'll, I'll re-say it. Who did you think over the course of long-term booking was the best and most exciting booker? Well, I think Jerry Jarrett probably. Because he had a he had a different way of looking at it. And the other bookers looked at it in a similar fashion. But he could uh he could entertain thoughts of something stupid, silly. And he'd run it for five or six weeks. But one of those bookers told me one time, if you're ever a booker, always book something that you personally enjoy. It's like your own little plaything. So you can play with it, see it grow or not grow <laughs> or die or, or bloom. But always book something that you enjoy seeing yourself and entertain yourself. I think uh, I think Jerry Jarrett told me that. And I've listened to his advice and and I have booked a couple of things that I enjoyed booking myself. And one of those, and you could actually if you studied some of my past booking experiences, it was the guy who couldn't win a match. Yeah. The perennial loser. And if you just stay on it and stay on it and stay on it, and the guy cries and goes on like, oh, my luck's going to change. Today's the day. I feel it. And he goes out there. And if you make an issue about it, <laughs> it gets over. So, well, that's what I've learned from them. We are going to go to our first bit of news, Dutch. And Okay. Okay. I I was looking back, I was thinking in my head just before I wrote all these questions, I was thinking, God, nothing's happened this week. And then I went through and I found loads of really amusing things. Like, nothing really important happened, but just a lot of little things uh, that you yeah. can comment on are always amusing. I suppose the biggest one is Hulk Hogan's recent criticism of pro wrestlers today. Now it's I'm looking of, for some, some Oh No, something don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, I'm listening. When I got in, this is Hulk Hogan talking in a recent podcast, when I got in wrestling, if you wanted to be a wrestler, okay, there's a guy there. He's got two big cauliflower ears, his nose is broken, his teeth are knocked out. He's got four kids at home. This next guy <laughs> over here, he was an NCAA champion. He's got a steel plate in his forearm. He's His name's Harley Race. Good luck with him. Then the other two guys, they look like serial killers. And if you wanted to be a wrestler, you've got to take their job and take food out of their family's mouths. Everybody I wrestled looked like a monster-sized man nowadays there's a lot of guys that look like wrestlers there's a lot of guys that don't a lot of guys who look like wrestlers and a lot of guys who look like they should be bagging my groceries so the difference is how athletic the guys are smaller guys can do all kinds of crazy stuff they do so much stuff so much impressive stuff in one match i wouldn't do that much in a year what does it mean so is hulk hogan basically saying that a lot of wrestlers today uh don't look like wrestlers of the past and that is bad well a lot of wrestlers today look like athletes let me say that but they run the uh the problem of looking similar and i'm just saying let me let's just look at wwe right now they got pretty deadly they're english guys then they have austin theory then they have 
Who's the other guy? Wallen, something Wallen. But they all look alike, and they're all about the same size. See, what used to happen in WWE was Vince didn't want anybody. But this is what I heard. Because in the Hogan years, people would go to see Hogan. And when Hogan wasn't on the card because, you know, he needs some time off too. But Vince didn't want to take him to take any time off because he was their only marquee name was Hulk Hogan. If Hulk wasn't on the show, eh, I'll go or not go. But if he was on the card, yeah, it would sell out. And the same way with Stone Cold. I'm going to see Stone Cold or The Rock. I'm going to see The Rock, our Undertaker. So Vince come up with an idea. Well, he wants people to go see the brand. He wants them saying when they buy a ticket, I'm going to see the WWE. Which is kind of forward thinking. But in the process... He kind of spread it out too much, I think. Because I don't know anybody that says I'm going to go see. They say I'm going to go see wrestling. I'm not really going to go see WWE. I don't care. But if you got the star there, like Roman Reigns, and he's the only one of the of the current stock of performers now that people say I'm going to go see Roman Reigns and the bloodline. But he, he had dropped that years ago, and he didn't want any one name to overshadow the brand. Now, Huck was right. He was over because, and there was several reasons he's, he was over, that WWE, they don't do anymore. You never saw Hulk Hogan, back in those days, wrestle on TV. Mm -hmm. You never saw it. Because you're not buying a ticket to see him. You can see him on TV and advertise that he's coming, but you never saw him wrestle on TV until it was a pay-per-view that you had to pay for or one of those NBC Saturday nights things called what? What were they called? Saturday night's main event. They put him on that. Mm -hmm. And when he was on it, they had tremendous ratings. Because just look at it. Here's, here's Hulk Hogan. He comes out. He's bigger than life. And he comes out to the Rocky theme. People would stand up before he would get there. When they would hear that Rocky, here he comes. Get ready. Then when they saw him, spotlights on him. It's part of the show. And he made a uh, spectacle of it. Taking five minutes to get to the ring. But that was part of the show. And then he would... He would do that, and he he would play to the crowd. And Look, can I ask you something, Dutch? Right. So uh, this is more of a criticism, especially with AEW, because so many of their wrestlers are, you know, under five ten, very very slim build. Is there a is there a part when you've got the you know, yes, they look athletic, but then at some point it's got to be you look like you couldn't break an egg. Yeah, well, there's some of them there that look like they can't break an egg. Who's the guy? That does the kicking on the legs. What's his name? Curve, uh, Orange short, Cassidy. Not... Orange Cassidy. I don't get it. But he's kind of over. And they got another one that runs around Pancha's face. He's uh, uh, he... uh, Darby Allen. Well, him too. He... Somebody give him a sandwich. <laughs> and who's the guy? His name's Dan Housen. Dan Housen, yeah. But Dan Housen is entertaining in short burst, but there is a spot for him. But their big guys, they kind of downplay some of their big guys. I don't know why, but see with Hulk, he couldn't have regular sized guys working against him because all of a sudden you got that. This don't look right. He had to work with the King Kong Bundys and the Kamala. And, and the monster heels they had up there. And that was the secret for Memphis for many, many years. They followed that rule. They would bring in the monster heel. He'd go through a couple of baby faces, 
working his way to Lawler because all the fans knew that when he gets to Lawler, Lawler was the king and Lawler would put a stop to it. So Lawler, over the years, uh, educated the people that this guy may be big, he may be tough. <clears throat> but when I face off against him, it's a whole new game. Because people will come to see the baby face win. They will not come to see the baby face loose. And Lawler educated them to believe and truthfully that he could he that he could win the match. And let me say this. When a heel started in Memphis, his really his productive time was like nine months. Give him nine months, and he'd be gone. Because if he lasted more than nine months, he actually hurt himself uh, if he wanted to come back. Because he couldn't be with Lawler all that time. <clears throat> and he would grow old, mm. which is a, a lot of WWE's problem. A lot of their wrestlers, a lot of their talents – grow stale, not old, stale, doesn't have a thing to do with the way they work. I call it viewer fatigue. You just get tired of seeing him. Like Ricochet, tremendous athlete. I really like to watch his moves. But after seeing him four weeks in a row, what else is he going to break out? Because he has no personality. At all. They can't cut it out of him. They've tried, but he's still, he just, he just cut and dried in his interviews and he's not exciting. There's um, something that I want to bring to your attention. I've not written it down anywhere. Is I, when I was putting this script together, there was a uh, cultaholic maybe put it on Twitter and you should have seen the uh, when Hulk Hogan said this bagging the groceries comments and you should have seen the people replying the internet wrestling community embarrasses themselves time and again with <laughs> stuff like just crap that they say it's like oh yeah well hulk hogan was he there's so many better wrestlers in there let me tell you something i don't mean to take the al snow thing here but hulk hogan was the greatest wrestler one of the greatest wrestlers of all time because he drew the most and that's Absolutely. what made him a great wrestler listen Greatness in this business depends on how much money you made the promoter or how much money you made the other talents. Okay, take Ricochet, a great wrestler, put him on top in Madison Square Garden, do all kind of angles with him, do whatever you want to do with him. He won't draw 5,000 people. If you took Hulk Hogan back in there today, <clears throat> he'd probably sell it out. Stone Cold Steve Austin, would you rank him as one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, ring wise? Do you know before the neck drop, he was he was a great, he was a very good technical wrestler as well, and then he became a great brawler. So depends what you consider a great wrestler, but I consider both of those things a great wrestler as well as a great draw. Well, The Rock, say him was he a great wrestler? <laughs> Technically, no. Uh, but he had his timing was fantastic, his speed was fantastic. But he had Absolutely. a few moves. His, his performance. I hated his stupid sharpshooter, though. He couldn't do it properly. It was annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but being great, it's according to the parameters you put on it. Exactly. Did you draw the money? Or did you sell any tickets? You sell any pay per views? <clears throat> because the person that is going to draw. That much money, 99% or 100% of the time, makes the main event. Now, a lot of people say, well, why didn't this match go on the main event? You, you ever heard that? Why does it say Stone Cold and this guy, why weren't they their main event? I'll give you a, fanta I'll give you a fantastic example. WrestleMania 18, Triple H okay. and Chris Jericho were the main event because yep. they had the belt and also yep. Triple H. I'm sure was uh, arguing his uh, point across. And under them was The Rock and Hollywood Hulk Hogan. And we all mm -hmm. knew what the real main event was. We all knew who was on the posters, but they didn't go on last. But they were the main event. So who who went on last? Triple H and Chris Jericho. You know why? 
because Triple H probably been married to Stephanie or no, was about to be married. I would say that their match would probably be a better match work work wise than Rock and Hogan. It turns out it wasn't. It wasn't that good for a main event. It wasn't that great, and I think it was just the well, storyline going in was horrible as well. So no one remembers. Well, that's it. that's what that's what I would say. Mm. We, but then again, hey, wrestling is its own world. It makes its own rules. <clears throat> it makes it up as it goes along. And when you try to put rhyme or reason to it, uh, we can surmise anything. But whether that's true or not, nobody knows. I uh, want to make a mention of this next news story. There's a couple of this is news story, a couple down that I can't wait to ask you. But uh, X Pac turning down AEW appearances. So this is to Sports Keeda. Billy Gunn said the following, we tried to get Sean Waltman in AEW a couple of times. Things just didn't work out, but I think if the time's right, he would be a great asset because he still has huge popularity and everybody knows him and he's such a good guy. He would not only help the younger talent as well as be a good, good representative for our company. He'd be amazing if we could get him here. Dave Meltzer further added that AEW wanted to get Waltman in in May and October 2022. He turned them down, uh, uh, turned them down both times. But it was really only for like a one-time appearance, sort of like Sabu has done recently. You know, it's a, it's a nice, hello, you know, someone from the past kind of thing, and then they forget you. Whereas I think Sean has got far more to offer than just one appearance. That's what I would say. I would say he doesn't want to burn his WWE bridge. I think he's good friends with Hunter. And he don't want to go up there. And I don't know what kind of money they offer him. Probably good money. But I think that loyalty, and since WWF and WWE were the ones who made him, that's where his home is. And I don't think he wants to, I think him and Triple H still talk. And he may have heard some of the stories coming out of AEW that the talent doesn't listen to advice that well. So if they were bringing him in in that capacity, if nobody's going to listen to him, why even bring him? But that's that's that to me, Sean's a good guy. After he grew up, got out of his teenage mentality, but once he got out of that, I think he has a he has a lot to offer. And does he help out with NXT or no? I don't think so. Maybe he does like guest training. I don't think he's had a full time position for many years now. I know he came into TNA a few times. Or you know, the well, times that, he turned up. Well the landscape has changed. So when did they want Sean in uh AEW? Well, apparently last year a couple of times he turned them down, but they were they weren't for like backstage roles. They were just for a, a a one-time curiosity, uh, you know, appearance in front of the crowd. Uh, I'm trying to think. So, would the first time you met X Pac, Sean Waltman, that would have been WWF when he was still the kid back then, wasn't it? Uh, probably 1995. So, good guy. He was the smallest person on the roster. He was what six, six, six foot six one, and he was considered a midget. <laughs> well, yeah, because they had those giants. I don't think he's six one. He may be six. He may be foot. right under. Yeah, uh, he's not. But he was young, and he had worked that angle with Scott Hall. That got him over. And when he beat Scott Hall, he was over. Because they told a story with this young, wet behind the ears kid that everybody could identify with, especially the young people. And he got him over. And by his work, he stayed over. We will move. Uh, very briefly, I won't read this otherwise, but uh, did you ever meet Kevin Wackles Nails? Yes, I did. Did you really? Uh, he was there with me too. But I had no relationship with him. If I said hello, I don't remember. I, I may have met him. Weird guy. <laughs> he walked around and he had a way of looking. He he looked disturbed, mm. even when he was he was in a dressing room. And 
you know, sometimes your inner, your inner uh, radar goes off said, hmm, there's something about this guy that is a little bit off kilter. Just back away slowly. And I tried not to. That's how I've survived all these years, even when I was growing up. Mm. When I would meet people and when my radar would tell me, get away, I was gone. Always trust your instincts. Uh, we're going to move on. This is the one I wanted to hear from you from. So it was recently revealed that somebody called Don Stevens has been taking down videos of AEW botches on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Is actually a pseudonym for AEW referee Aubrey Edwards. Uh, apparently, she had to put her real name onto a form to get like some copyright takedown thing instead of like this uh, this affectation. So I know you like a good botch. I know you love a good botch video and. Uh, I, I, I think we both follow the same person who keeps putting up these AW botch videos that are constantly being taken down now, but isn't it a bit of a, in my opinion, a bad look for AW to be going after these companies that are highlighting sort of like negative videos, whereas if there weren't so many botches in the first place, it wouldn't be that big of a deal? Well, I think it's, I think it embarrasses Tony Khan. But to me, I think it's great advertising for them hmm. because they get these guys going out there doing this crazy stuff. Now, one day it will backfire on them. Somebody will get hurt, maimed, possibly killed. And I don't know how they're going to go to court and tell the court that, well, we told these guys not to do that. Well, why'd they do it? They they didn't follow orders. But do you have any anything written down that you told them not to do it? Well, no, but it was by word of mouth. Well, did you, did you know he's going to do it? Yeah, we knew he's going to do it, but we told him not to do it. I think it could backfire in their face because that guy Dante Martin, when he broke his leg, and I'm sure I I don't know. Well, maybe you could have an agent sign off on it, but it is very, very risky. And what I want to tell Dante, I don't even know the kid, but I do respect his attitude about, I'm going to do this because I think the wrestling fans want to see it. I want to be remembered for it. And he broke his leg and a lower leg too. Oh, which yeah, was ankle, I think, yeah. Even harder to mend because you have more to mend, I guess. I'm not a doctor, <clears throat> but I did play one on TV one time. Mm -hmm. uh, but see, the fans will remember that 15 minutes or a day, but he will remember that every day of his life from here on out. Let, let me ask you this, right? Think, thinking, why in the hell did I do that? What do you make of what do you make of the social media censorship situation then? What do you mean? Well, uh, a well, uh, Aubrey Edwards, AEW going after oh. unfavorable posts. Well, she's just told to do that. That's not her decision. That is the company's decision. <clears throat> but if you're going to, what if you go after somebody who's who's just knocking the company verbally or through words. But what they do, they have their own little cadre, I guess that's the word you use, of about 30 people, 40 people. And they were all rushed to this place and just badmouth the guy or badmouth the truthfulness of it or because I noticed that during the 2016 election, when I would put something up that didn't agree with somebody's political viewpoint, all of a sudden I had these people that I had, that don't follow me or don't do anything. They come and attack me personally. And they weren't even wrestling fans. They could have been bots. I don't know. Could have been. But who knows? But I can't spend all my time replying to them because I'd be replying to them all the time. But 
Uh, I, I think her her services could be better used in other positions. I tell you where her services better be used is this Saturday night. Then she have the match. Well, uh, Aubrey will be making her AEW in ring debut when she teams up with Mark Briscoe and Papa Briscoe against Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, and Karen Jarrett. I mm-hmm. saw th- I saw the thing where I can't remember who hit her over the head with the guitar. That was quite funny. Karen. Yeah, it was Karen then, and then she fell over. Karen fell over you after know, doing it. You know who suggested that angle? Go on. Jeff texted me, <laughs> or I texted him. I said, "Listen, you need to have Karen busting." bust the guitar over her head. Or I may have said it a different way. And he said, and but everything is cleared through Tony. But I guess Jeff brought that up. And now not only is Jeff getting a paycheck, Karen is getting a paycheck. But Karen is much better qualified than a lot of those other girls, even though she's not a wrestler. She can get heat. You 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 will legitimately get mad at Karen Angle when she blasts you. I've seen her at TNA and the people, they wanted to kill her. And because I'm saying there is an element of doubt in somebody's mind. If if say I'm talking to somebody on the street or at a at an arena, or even I'm doing an interview in the ring. And the people get it in their heads that this guy believes this shit. He is really believing this crap. When I was Zeb Coulter, man, they were half of them out there who wanted to kill me. Half of them. But then again, the thing about playing an in-the-middle character was half of them loved me. When I was playing Zeb Coulter, I don't mean to get onto another subject. But all the WWE people, agents, writers... They were saying, they're going to hate you. Till the first time I went out. And then I got my inkling that, well, maybe that hate is not going to consolidate itself like you expect. Maybe there's some people out there who likes the message I'm giving. And I've said this before. I never told them that because you can know too much for your own good. So just shut up and uh, do what you're told and go out and do your job. With with Right, so what did you suggest exactly? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to delve into this now. Did you, oh, yeah. did you merely suggest the guitar thing, or did you say maybe Karen and Aubrey? Or uh, how, how far no, was your I suggestion? Said, no, my suggestion was, I think I may have said, Jeff, you need to bust the guitar over, over her head. And then he said, why if Karen breaks the guitar overhead. I said, that's even better. Now, now it's a personal war and they will build that whole match around Karen and Aubrey getting in the ring. Mm-hmm. And when it does, I think the we'll, we'll see what happens. And they, they don't got to teach Aubrey that much because Karen... She's not a wrestler. She can't teach them that much anyway, but they'll work to that point, then they'll do the finish. So I, I, I think that <clears throat> the baby faces will go over. I think Aubrey will probably beat Karen, and then they'll hold her down, and then, <laughs> wow, <laughs> well, Karen beats the crap out of them. <laughs> but it should be good. I might even watch it myself. You see, do you know what? Like The way you put it is – it's all of a sudden when you say it, it becomes so obvious. Of course, that's what you should do. Yeah, that kind of thing. Has AEW? I, I know. Uh, I know you got a phone call at some point in the past, recent past. But has anyone ever said within AEW or even WWE, hey, maybe we should put you on payroll to do a sort of remote booking job or or be an advisor or anything like that? Tony Khan called me one time uh, about six months ago. And wanted to know how I was doing. So I told him fine. And I think he was he was kind of fishing around if I wanted to take any kind of role with AEW. Physically, I couldn't do it because 
I have mobility problems. But virtually, I could. But virtually only works, and, and, and a position only works if people listen to you. And then sometimes, now I've been really, really successful in a couple of places I, I booked, Puerto Rico being one of them. But I was the only one that I was, I was the creative team all by myself, me and one other guy. And so, so any Malibu. idea? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Malibu. He was a great booker, great booker. <clears throat> and, uh, and non offensive too, I might add. Mm. But I had nobody to run it run it through that's when i came up to my decision that sometimes the first idea you have is probably the best idea because around a creative table you have a good idea and you send it to this person to see what they want to add or detract and then it goes from that person to the person down here to go around the table and i've seen it come back and i've said this before that sometimes the same personnel you had in it when it started are not in it when it gets back around to you. So, but keep it simple. That's like kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, and you won't fail. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I think AEW kind of, and WWE to a large extent, they put too much in these matches. Save some of it and just do the finish. Say they have a finish that's two minutes long to get in. If they need that exactly that two minutes, why don't they just do half of it, then do the finish? A lot of times, less is more. Mm -hmm. But that's me talking. AEW needs Dutch. Uh, we're going to move on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to get your payday, man. What can I say? Booker T's uh, unhappiness with his TNA run. Uh, so this is via his podcast. Now, this is a bit of a mouthful as well. Stop me when you've got the idea of it. When I got to TNA, I really had high hopes to really, really be able to capture some moments in that company. After about two weeks, I realized none of that was going to happen. So I just started acting a fool. I really started acting a fool. I'm actually ashamed of myself for some of the stuff I did in TNA because I knew it wasn't going anywhere and I lost my uh, zeal for really going out and performing the way I think I always had before. I lost my motivation, I had a two-year contract, and I lost my motivation because I didn't see a lot of guys. I've been watching The Last Dance lately, in fact I've watched that documentary as well, it's great. And to watch Michael Jordan's drive, he's like a tyrant, he wanted nothing but the best from the guys that were around him. And I know when I went into TNA I had that same feeling as far as I want to push these guys, really see how far they can go because I knew I had some young talent that I could go out there and maybe create some magic with. When none of that happened, I lost my passion just because I knew it was out of my hands. Now, Dutch, uh, when we talk about TNA, you look back on it in like a, a PTSD almost. You've forgotten most of it because it wasn't <laughs> your happiest time. I know that, I but it sounds the, like... After I, was in, I was in catering room. Yeah, right? <laughs> it sounds like with Booker T, it's the same thing for him. After two weeks, he gave up. Well, I'm not saying that He's, that's his opinion, and I kind of agree with it. I respect his ability. I respect his talent. <clears throat> but I think it took more than two weeks, maybe a month. But Booker T came in there, and he was almost, he thought, I think, in my opinion, he was bigger than the brand. He had been in WWE, and he had accomplished all these things. But when he got to TNA, uh, he only got there because WWE finished him up. They gave him his notice and said, we're not going to renew your contract. So he was looking for another place to work, and he found it in TNA. And it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't hard for him to find it because he was a big name. <clears throat> So he came in and, but he, like he said, he wanted to do things his way because he didn't have, I don't think, the, the faith in TNA creative that he should have had, I think, just out of respect. And I don't even doubt him for that. But, he, uh, Booker was very difficult at times to work with because you would lay out where you wanted this to go and he would immediately 
try to change it because he didn't like it. And the reason he didn't like it, and it took me months to kind of figure this out. He wanted to know how it would make him look, not only in his with his present employer, TNA and the fans, but he, that was one lens he was looking at it through, which is most of what everybody else was looking through at the time, the lens they were in now. But he looked at it through another lens, the WWE lens, and how that would make him look to them. Because he knew Vince watched the show, <clears throat> and he didn't want to do anything that didn't portray him in the, in the best light. Not the strongest light, but the best light. And I can understand that. I remember one time we had him to do, had him doing something and his agent laid out what he wanted to do. Well, he didn't like it. So he ran to Vince. He said, well, hey, brother. Oh, Vince Russo, sorry. I was Vince say, Russo. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah. I had Vince McMahon in my mind. Sorry. Yeah. He, uh, he ran to Vince Russo and said, you know, I don't think I should be doing this, brother. And uh, Funny how that sounded like Hulk Hogan, but you know <laughs> what I mean. So Vince sent him to me. Well, I wasn't the one who booked it in the first place. So when he came over and told me that, is this what we really wanted? Or, and can, can I change it? And I said, hey, I would send him to Jeff. Jeff, and this is what Jeff would do a lot of times. You remember those, those, uh, Earphones you used to put in your ear that had the blue lights on it? No, I don't. Well, they would put it in oh, their ear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Bluetooth, like the single speaker Let, thing. Bluetooth. Through phone, yeah. Jeff used to walk around with that, and the Bluetooth was always on. So if he didn't want to talk to somebody, he'd go. <laughs> like, oh, I got somebody on the line. But he would send him back to Vince, which in turn... Vince would send him back to me for me to tell him the same thing I had told him previously. Go see Jeff. Jeff would send him back to Vince, but he wouldn't go to Vince. He would go to Dixie. And then Dixie would go to, to Vince, and Vince would say, well, go to Dutch. And finally, Dixie would come to me. And do you think we could change it? I said, look, tell him to do whatever he wants to do. As long as he stays in the parameters of where we need him to be, let him do it. And so he, he would do that. I remember one time he started, he, he was doing commentary. And he's, a, he's pretty good on commentary. but he, <laughs> And I think this is one of the things he may have been ashamed of. I was ashamed of it, really. Because he started talking in an English accent. And I think you told me earlier that he did that in WWE when he was king of the ring, or he was. Yeah, he was doing a he was doing some sort of royalty thing. I, w I wouldn't say an English accent. I'd say like a really poor. I've got an English accent. Booker T has got some accent that's just has never <laughs> been has never been achieved before um... or since. But yeah, he was doing that. In, <laughs> he was doing that in WWE, and then I think he just sort of assumed I... he was continuing it in TNA. I would like to see artificial intelligence. Copy <laughs> Booker's accent and his voice. You break But he it. got to talking in uh, in a royal accent. Let me say that. And one time I says, and I didn't know why. So I asked uh, Vance, why is he talking in like a British English accent? I don't know. I asked Jeff, I don't know. Nobody knew. And nobody corrected him. <laughs> so he kept talking in that voice for whatever reason for like months. So, but anyway, what I, I, I'm saying, I, I don't think Booker is totally wrong, but I I know, and some other, uh, some other people came in uh, to, to look at what they were doing, not only through the TNA lens, but through the WWE Vince lens and they didn't like it. I'll because they knew Vance, and they knew Vance would, would be thinking, that makes us look bad. 
not you look bad, but it makes us look bad. And they know how Vince holds grudges, so they wouldn't do it. <laughs> let me uh, let me do a brief clarification on why Booker T left. I just Googled it before, but it, it, I didn't know if he quit or was fired. But uh, Booker T had his name added onto this uh, signature pharmacy scandal in 2007, where it was claimed that he'd bought some uh, illicit bodybuilding substances or something like that uh, via via mail. Uh, but Booker had always denied that he'd ever done any, uh, any, you know, denied all impropriety, and he requested his release from WWE as sort of like a protest, uh, protest quitting kind of thing. So then he went to TNA, but it sort of lends credence to your uh, theory of Booker T always having one eye on WWE because he wasn't fired from WWE, he left, and maybe that made that path to go back to WWE a lot easier. You know, I've never heard that before in my life. Maybe I should read more. <clears throat> have you never heard? Have you never heard the signature pharmacy thing? I've heard about it, but I didn't know he, they got rid of him for that. But no, no, Which no. He, he quit. He quit over that. In fact, well, I heard they released him, uh, or he was going to he was going to quit, or they were going to release him. So he decided to quit. Maybe what I what I heard. Maybe. One more bit of news, then we will uh, talk about your uh, fan questions. I know we promised it. Uh, this will probably be quite an easy one. Ryback is uh, trying to angle himself into a retirement match with Goldberg, believing it's what all wrestling fans want to see. During a rant about ringside news on Twitter, Ryback wrote, it, uh, it being Goldberg versus Ryback, will have the best story, be the most viewed match with social media views, and exceed all expectations. What would your expectations be with Ryback versus a nearly 60-year-old Goldberg at this point? I don't think Goldberg has been in the business long enough to claim dementia. I mean, I don't know what he's thinking. I don't think it would... I don't think it could fill up 2000 seat hall and if you put it on pay-per-view you couldn't charge but ten dollars for it nine dollars and i don't think they get that many buys then nobody wants to see goldberg and ryback just to just to say you and said goldberg, and goldberg you said goldberg sure. but uh ryback is the one who said this not goldberg i mean ryback nobody wants to see that first of all goldberg's not going to do it Unless you can guarantee him $3 million or whatever. And I don't blame him. And what are they going to do? You can sit back right now and imagine these two athletically gifted performers like Ryback and like Goldberg going out for a five-star classic that lasts for 15 to 20 minutes. Can you imagine that? I think it would make Ric Flair's last match uh, look like a an eight star match. Believe me, that would be a match of it'd be memorable. It would because it, <laughs> I think that could, could possibly qualify, even unseen, as the worst match ever conceived or thought of so i don't know i'll say this it's not happening uh i spoke to stevie richards uh he's, he's currently on my channel uh, now wsi for people who don't watch it and he on one of the latest clips he says there are things called clash of styles but then there's also the clash of the exact same style that can be just as bad as as mismatch of styles it's true because what are they going to do? Both of them do that strongman deal. Who's going to be the first one to break? Goldberg is not going to do that. Ryberg's not going to do it. What I think he's doing, he just he just writing stuff to see what kind of response he gets. But I read some of the replies. wasn't <laughs> very wasn't very positive <laughs> at all. So when you're talking on Twitter or whatever platform you're on, and you only get like 15 replies and about only five of them are kind of wanting to see it, you can kind of 
put down that no, the, the, the demand is not there. I'd actually pay not to see it. <laughs> if they said, listen, we're going to send this to you free unless you want to pay $9.99 to, to keep it off your channel. We need, Yeah, we need to go fund me for not having this match happen. $50,000 <laughs> or something like that. You know Ryback will watch this as well, don't you? Oh, I don't care. Mm. And, I, and that was another guy that I didn't have that much that much uh, association with. Because why would he be talking to me? I was just a low-life manager, a, a low-level manager. Why would he even bother with me? Of course, I don't, I don't care. <clears throat> I've been in the business most of my life. I don't care. I treat people the way they treat me, and he didn't treat me disrespectfully, but he just never went out of his way to to say hello or do anything. Shall we do some fan questions? Let's do some. Go on then. Right. This one, I was desperate to ask you this for ages. Alex, the Headhunters, by all accounts, they are an interesting pair of characters. Any funny or memorable stories about them? Now, these are the uh, great big fat twins that look like Abdullah the Butcher, who could do moon souls. Yeah, and, uh, and they were Puerto Rican, weren't they? Yeah, they're Puerto Rican. They're from yeah. Puerto Rico. Give us some stories. Well, when I was in Puerto Rico, they used them a couple of times. Huge guys. And you're amazed at how agile they are. <clears throat> One of the questions I had is, who taught them to, to, to work? Who taught them to wrestle? And they had an, an old-time referee who had a little bit of a – a wrestling school. I think he had something to do with it, but they had some really good moves. And one of them was that backflip off the top onto somebody. And I'm thinking now that's where the beauty of wrestling comes in. Let me put you in this position, James, mm -hmm. you're in there training with, with this, these 400 pound guys. And they're not real tall. They're probably more going around than they are going up. But somebody says, go and lay in the middle of the ring. And this guy is going to do a backflip and land on you. Would you do that? My question would be, what's the payday? Is it <laughs> $3 million like Goldberg? Because otherwise, no. Yeah. But see, that's the beauty of wrestling. See, when you do a move like that, you almost take a Hippocratic oath to be a wrestler, do no harm. So when he comes off, you want to be able to get up and walk to the dressing room afterwards, take a shower and get in your car and go wherever you got to go. It takes a maximum of trust to do that to the twins ability. I never heard of them hurting anybody because they were, I heard a lot. I never worked with them. They were light as a feather. Of course, their matches didn't go long because they didn't have the cardio to go long, but they really made a name for themselves in Japan through uh, Victor Quinones. Oh, Victor Quinones found these guys. Victor Quinones and uh, Dominican Republic. That's where they, and I know Dominican Republic's on everybody's mind right now. They're 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 great wrestling, but uh, that that's that's where they got over the best. They wouldn't use them in Puerto Rico that much. They wouldn't use them for the company I booked, which was Victor Quinones' company. He's dead now. The IWA and Carlos Colon never used them for the other company, so they couldn't work at home. And so they had to go away from home to get work. But I don't, I, I don't know them that well. They didn't speak English. I know that. And I have no stories about them other than that. Uh, I, th I believe, um, yeah, Japan and Mexico instead of Puerto Rico. They Mexico, not wrestling. Dominican Republic. Yeah. Mexico. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's the story of um, 
Uh, they, they very briefly were in the 96 Royal Rumble for you geeks out there like me who remember these things. And then he came back in mid-97. So this is after you left the WWF. Jim Cornette, who hadn't been seen for ages, just turns up on the raw, raw entrance way and says, hey, I've got a new team. And he blows a whistle, which I don't think he's ever used before or since. And then the Samoan SWAT team, or the Headhunters, whatever you call them, rush the ring to Owen and Bulldog. And, and as you say, the £400 each. The first thing that the Bulldog does is body slam one of them. So so that was their mystique done in about 10 seconds. That's it. <laughs> and that was it? Yeah, oh, yeah. They, just, yeah, they, yeah, they got let go after that. Or, or they may have had one more match and then they were gone again. Yeah, well, that's what they were, that's what they had planned for them. Mm. Bring them in. We'll look at them. We'll use them here. And but then they looked at them, and I think everybody says it will be more work getting them over than what we could get get on the back end, mm. and which is probably true. Vince Vince doesn't like fat people. Period. <laughs> you look at his whole body of work. If you see a real fat person, they used him on top against Hogan, or they didn't use him. Or Vader you didn't use him to the and best Vader, of ability. Well, Vader wasn't really fat. He was just big, big guy. Yokozuna. That's the that's the uh, Yokozuna. Yeah. And there was another guy that was light as a feather. You wouldn't expect that because he was more than four hundred. He was probably close to five fifty. Uh, anyway, we will move on. And uh, this is the one I think you've been looking forward to answering. Dino D. Uh, and this is me just writing this. We found a wrestler that doesn't like Dutch. Can you believe it? How dare them? James and Dutch, I was watching a shoot interview with the late <laughs> Brickhouse Brown. Brickhouse Brown said that Dutch was the worst promoter that he ever worked for. Somehow. Uh, he claimed that he may have had a chance working for TNA since Dutch is gone. I would love to hear Dutch's side of the heat with him and Brickhouse Brown. Thanks. And I've no idea what this entails at all. Well, Brickhouse never liked me. It's because I never used him in a good position. Because I didn't see anything Brickhouse Brown money-wise that would get me off that that feeling. <clears throat> Brickhouse Brown, I know of zero places where he's ever drawn a dime. Brickhouse got into the business by lying. He said he'd wrestled somewhere. Somebody, somebody used him and he got through a mat somewhere. I don't know how. <clears throat> and then, then he got kind of trained somewhere. But Brickhouse had a great body, but the body doesn't mean that much if you have zero personality. Brickhouse didn't have any personality. When he did an interview, he was he was just he was just there. And when he when he got off the interview, you would say, What was that about? But and I work with him mostly in Mid South. Because in the Mid South region of the United States, which takes in Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Arkansas, it's heavily Afro American. That's why Junkyard Dog was so over there, because <clears throat> he got over with his own people. Brickhouse didn't even get over with them. <laughs> So if he's not getting over with his, and that's why he was used because we would go to, I don't know if it was brick house, but I was, I was in this Mississippi town and I look out at the crowd and it was 80 something, something percent Afro-Americans, black people. You'd have to really search the crowd to find any white people. And at the time, I carried a bullwhip. Oh, this, my God. This was the snowman, was it? It was the snowman. I'm sorry. But anyway, I'm saying it's a heavily Afro-American town. But I, I took the bullwhip to the to the, some of those same towns working uh, 
with Brickhouse. But Brickhouse, he just had no personality. And even his own fans, the, uh, the black fans that you know, would, would normally support him more than anything else, they didn't really support him because I never knew him to draw money, and I never disliked him. I just never was a was a friend to him. So, and I never knew that I was the worst promoter that he ever knew. I never knew I was a promoter. <laughs> I always thought I was kind of a booker or just a regular talent. If I was a promoter, guess what? I would have never met him because I wouldn't have booked him. So, but anyway, that's my that's my feelings about Brickhouse. Brickhouse has passed away now. Rest in peace. And I was looking him up. You know, you sent me this this outline of the the interview today, mm -hmm. and I looked him up, and uh, I read that it was reported that he died a week before he actually died. He died of, I think, testicular or prostate, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, yeah. He died of that. And his mother came in there one day, and he looked dead. His eyes were rolled back in his head. His mouth was open. And they reported that, that he had passed away. And his mother called some people. And, and then while she was – and it, it's a mother's love for a son. I got that. She's crying, and all of a sudden she heard a voice. And it was Brickhouse's, Brickhouse's voice said, Mom, I'm, uh, Ma, I'm, I'm hungry. And he came back to life. And he lived another week. Hmm. So maybe maybe he got right with who he needed to get right with or he got right with his mother. And But, but don't let it be said that I disliked him. I just didn't. Very, very few people I did dislike. Brickhouse wasn't one of them. I just didn't like the way he worked, and I didn't have faith of him drawing money. We uh, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. We should do um, uh, a top five or top ten Dutch Mantel shit list one day. I think, but for, we'll do, we'll do that for next week. Uh, Mike McNulty, Baltimore. I may be crazy, but I swear I remember Dutch doing commentary with a bull or reindeer puppet on WCW Worldwide in 1990 or 1991. It might have been around Christmas time, and he named it Prancer or Donna. He did bad, in brackets, good vaudeville jokes with the puppet in the show's intro. I was about 10 years old then, and I thought it was hilarious. That memory has always stuck with me for some reason. However, I can find no evidence of it ever happening on the internet, but like I said, I may be crazy. Love the show. Keep up the great work, fellas. What's this guy's name, Mike? Mike McNulty. From where? Baltimore. Mike, let me tell you something. You need to put that crack pipe down <laughs> and go straight to injection injection of heroin. I think you may be closer to the truth. But since I read that and you read it back to me, I, I'm thinking, I think there was an introduction that I did. It was around Christmas where I did have a puppet and I would walk the puppet in, you know, my <laughs> hand. And I would talk to it, and then the other puppet would come out. And I don't know why I did this. It's, I guess it was pretty funny. Mike liked it. But it did happen. Now that I think about it, it did happen. So, Mike, you may have remembered something that maybe was it did happen. I've never seen a, a video of it or anything, but I do remember doing something really silly. And I remember we were laughing when we were doing it. So, and uh, Tony Schiavone was there. I need to ask Tony Schiavone, does he remember that? You think we could get Tony on? I think so, maybe. You want him on? I, I, do you know, I want Tony on and I want Jeff on. Jeff Jarrett. Oh, you want Jeff on? Yeah, I'd love Jeff. I nearly had an interview with him ages ago, and I, annoyingly, I was the one who had to cancel uh, uh -huh. And then um, I, I don't know if he's never forgiven me since, but uh, I'd love well, to have Jeff. They, they may not give me uh, an interview because I may be on the the toilet paper list of AEW because <laughs> I'm not their greatest supporter. But you're not the greatest detractor but, either. You fair? Well, yeah, I, I I think some of their stuff do, they do is pretty good. 
See, my my major concern about AEW is presentation. And their backstage interviews, they're Tony, Tony Khan, this is right to you. Your backstage interviews needs work badly. It's really almost embarrassing. And I don't know who are coaching these people or agenting these people, but uh, what's John Moxley's wife's name? What's her name? Renee Paquette. Yeah. Give that backstage uh, thing to Renee. She knows exactly how to do it. Was great in WWE with it. Great person. Love her to death. But give it to her, and I guarantee you, it'll be a lot better. Give us a story about Renee. I don't think I've ever, ever asked you about Renee. Okay. You like her? <laughs> no, no, just, yeah, you, just a, a story about her. Oh, she's uh, she's great. Very friendly. And uh, she's uh, easygoing. And I remember when she first got with John, I think they were making a trip and somehow either Renee got in the same car with John or John got in the same car with her and they developed a friendship and now they're married and they got a kid and they live in Vegas, I think. Mm. So I, I think they're happy. And John was the one who he had some little bit of a addiction problem. I think he's, he got that straightened out, and I think they're they're, they're happy. Mm. But and she's Canadian, and I met I met her mom one time, and she's a lot like her mom. She's very very funny, very uh, amiable, friendly, and she's easy to laugh. I got some pictures of her. We'll put, we'll put up one day of me and her. Mm. But uh, she's I have nothing to say badly about Renee Paquette. With Renee, you know, she, she must have been the only backstage interview because, you know, you get all these nameless, faceless, uh, quite a lot of women as well with WWE over like the last 10, 15, 20 years who were utter poo. And then the only one who was any good ever was Renee. She had a bit oh, of a yeah. personality. She looked great and she knew what she was talking about and she didn't ask everything. It's like, so uh, if I was doing like, do an impression of someone other than Renee, uh, Renee so Dutch, uh, something, something, something's happened. What do you think about that? Mm. Might as well have Johnny Five that? doing the interview. <laughs> Who? What about Ensmore? What's your name? What was that guy's name that Enzo. was with and Enzo? I just I don't know. He said that word and that that name popped in my head. <laughs> <clears throat> but she was very good. WWE has a girl now. What is her name? The dark-headed girl? Oh, I don't know. I don't on, know. On Raw and SmackDown? What's her name? Don't know. Very, very short. But but Renee blows her away. She's she's very, very good. Kayla Braxton. And I think Braxton, that's her name. She is nowhere, nowhere close to Renee's area of expertise. Our execution. Renee is good. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I wheeze through there, I'm going to ask this next question. Aaron, hi there. Really enjoy your podcast. The question I have for Dutch is, has he ever come across a champion in wrestling who not only refused to drop the title, but actually left the territory with the belt, stealing the actual championship? Thanks so much. Apart, apart from Ric Flair, oh, yeah. that's a very famous one. But any others? Oh, yeah. Snowman. <laughs> we, just, we just talked about him. He left Memphis because he said that the company owed him money, and Lauro said he didn't. And he says, well, I, I, I got the belt. So, and I don't know how they they got the belt back. I guess they gave him some money, I guess. But, and here's a, here's a story. I was the champion. <laughs> I'm telling a story on myself now. <laughs> I was a champion after Lawler had sold Memphis to a guy named Larry Burton. You ever heard about Larry Burton? Yeah, I think we've talked about the USWA 
shocking Larry, sales. Larry Burton. I found out later it wasn't even his real name. He was a con guy, a sw- uh, really a con con job. So when they were getting ready to close it up, and I saw they were getting ready to close it up, well, I was the, I think, the universal heavyweight champion, the big belt. And uh, I had it. And then Larry Burton called me one day, and he says, and he had a weird voice. You, you'd want to, really, really, if Larry Burton came and sat down with you right now, within five minutes, you'd want to punch him. <laughs> Just by the way he talked. He said, well, Dutch, I had to tell you, bye, 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 bye. Oh, you want to punch him. Because I used to, I have never cussed a man to his face like I've cussed Larry Burton. And Larry Burton would cuss me back to my face. I don't think anybody's ever cussed me that way either. But that was our relationship. So he called me one day, Dutch Larry Burton, when are you going to give that belt back? I said, what belt? You know what belt? (laughs) I said, oh, that belt I have now that, you know, that universal belt. Yeah, when are you going to give it back? I said, well, I can give it back at any time. He said, well, when? I said, well, when you pay me my money. What money? I said, the money you owe me. I don't owe you no money. I said, oh, yeah, you do. You owe me some money. Well, I don't owe you money. I said, Larry, you owe me money, you SOB. Then I started cussing. (laughs) That's how I just directed my comments at him. He says, what I owe you? I said, I think you owe me about 1600 bucks. Oh, hell no, 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 F no, F no, 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 no. He kept on. I said, well, I, this is the deal, Larry. Bring me my money, and I'll produce the belt. If not, it's not going anywhere. I'll sue you. I'll sue you. I says, well, sue me. I said, do you have any ownership papers on that belt? Do you have any papers that says that, or does Lawler have any? This was before Larry got there. Does Lawler have any paper that says he paid X number of dollars for the belt? I don't know. I said, well, you better be finding some. You better be finding some evidence that you own the belt. Otherwise, it's not going nowhere. And I said, anyway, I'm going to Puerto Rico. He said, well, I'll find you. I'll find you there. I'll see you there. I said, Larry, get the F out of here. I said, they can't find the governor there half the time. (laughs) So you can't find me. So and then he said, listen, I, I'm going to send Dave. Dave was his driver. And he was a, he was an engineer, not an engineer, but a computer graphics guy. He said, I'll send Dave. Just give Dave the belt, and I'll send you the money. I said, what? I said, is Dave going to bring some money? No, i I, I got to send that to you later. I said, Are you, do you think I'm stupid? I'm not turning over a belt to Dave or nobody else without an exchange to money for money to me first. I'm not doing it. So, and that's the last I heard of Larry Burton. So, where did the belt and, go in the end then? That's a, that's another story. Right. Well, let's hear it. When when I was in WWE, uh, what year was this? Uh, just before Larry bought but, it, uh, he bought it in '97. So I would suggest maybe '96 if you're still in WWF. Or is this? Like oh, I, oh, I remember. WWE came to Nashville one time. After this, I wasn't working for the company, and I went down there, and I I, I was leaving. And I looked back in the door, and there was Lawler. Lawler waved, and then and then Lawler made a uh, he made a a, a a motion like this, like. Like, where's the belt? And uh, I went, oh, yeah, it's in the car. I'll be right back. (laughs) Well, I went to the car, and I didn't see Lawler again for six years. (laughs) Uh, But but you know what happened to that belt? Funny thing. I took it to one of these low-life independent shows, and when I got back, guess what? The belt was missing. Imagine that. 
So I really don't know where it went. God, that would be. I wonder if. I wonder if uh, that belt, the original, would be worth thousands now. Wouldn't be worth ten thousand, maybe not, but it'd be worth a bit. Oh, it'd be worth a bit. Yeah, it would. So I need to check on that. Oh, <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> I can't check on that. I don't have the belt. How? What would I be? I'd be lying. So no, but the belt. The I don't have the belt anymore. Mm. I'll ask after we stop recording and see if the answer changes because I'd be really interested to know if you do have the belt or not. But you, mate, do you? Anyway, it doesn't matter. We'll find out another time. Next question. Kerwin White, was there ever an instance in your career where an opponent steadfastly refused to work with you or put you over? And I'm going to add this aside from Lex Luger because we've had the Lex Luger story already. Well, I should have said that about Lex. Lex, he just showed his, what an idiot. Not only did he did he wouldn't put us over, he didn't even want to work with us, me and Jaggers, when we were in uh, Mid-Atlantic, when we were in Charlotte. He didn't even want to work with us. But uh, I, I never remember that anybody saying no, but because, and you can imagine, if I, if I had worked with Bret Hart, who's going to win? Bret Hart. If I work with Vader, who's going to win? Vader. If I work with Flair, who's going to win? Flair. So not easy to not easy to pick out. I mean, it's easy to pick out who 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 wouldn't want to do it. But nobody really said I'm not I'm not putting him over. Not to but it'd have to be at my level, my mid mid card level at the time. But but in Memphis and places like that, and Puerto Rico and Mid South, you know, you were almost all kind of working together. So nobody would do that. And if you did, then you were just an asshole, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with you because it's a small territory. So you only had twenty guys. So word travels fast, but you just got twenty guys for it to go through. Mm -hmm. Next one, Ken. Great show, Dutch and James. I enjoy it very much. The Superfly spent quite a bit of time through the territories. I was wondering if Dutch worked with him, and if so, is there anything that he can share? Thank you very much. I never worked a territory with the Super Super with with, the gym, with Jimmy Jimmy Snooker. Yeah, I never worked a territory with him because when I I think he worked in Oregon, and I did have a chance to go to Oregon one time, and I. I made the call, and the, and the promoter said, Don Owens, call me back next week. I said, okay. So I sat down, and then guess what I did? This is before Google. This is before, you know, G Maps or any of that stuff. I got out an old Rand McNally road atlas, and I got to looking at, the trip from where I was, I was in Tennessee, the trip up to Oregon. I went, my God, it's like 2,000 miles. <laughs> and I decided, no, that is too far to go. I'm not going. But I heard a lot of good stories about, about Oregon. It actually, they said it, it, it paid fairly well. But they didn't run really big sized towns except maybe Portland. They may have ran Seattle. I don't know. But when I looked at the distance from where I was used to being to Portland, Oregon, mm. not only did I say no, I said a hell if it no. Because that's a hell of a drive and more than I would want to take on at the time. So no. I, I never, I never worked in uh, in Oregon, and that's where I would have met Jimmy. So I, I missed him. Yeah, you would have also worked with him in the AWA, which you definitely didn't uh, work in. I didn't go there. You definitely, uh, he was in Mid Atlantic briefly, um, but I'm, I, I wasn't I there think, then. Yeah, I don't think there's much crossover with you two. I know um, you were on the Survivor Series '96, where Jimmy returned for one night only in uh, Madison Square Garden on that pay per view, but I don't think you're in the same match oh I, I remember that i walked by his dress room i said snooker f you and he come <laughs> out and I, punched, I punched him in the mouth and then they pulled us apart uh, other than that i don't have any dealings with him 
<clears throat> I can't believe you didn't remember that until uh, just then as well. I know. I just, <laughs> I just had to have something jog my memory. <laughs> Next one, Derwin Baker. Hi, Dutch. Do you know if there's any issues between Carlos Colon and Jose Gonzalez? I've been seeing videos on YouTube where Gonzalez talks about falling out with Cologne. Have a blessed day. Oh, yeah, there were a lot of issues between them because the invader, at one point, he didn't own any any of the company, I don't think. But him and Carlos used to butt heads over the booking of it and where I didn't like invaders booking. I didn't much like Invader because he was a uh, he was actually he thought he was more important than what he was and and was it a was it hesitant about showing you that you know he he had the power and you didn't yeah I never much much liked even being around him or following his booking because his booking didn't even make sense to me. I never sat down and had a logical, like thoughtful conversation about booking because I don't think he would have, he would have followed it anyway. But uh, I had a match with him one night and the security in Puerto Rico at the time was horrible. People would throw stuff at you. I mean, I mean, sling it because baseball is like a national sport there. They have three, they have three things that are national sports, cockfighting, baseball before baseball, politics and wrestling <laughs> at, at, at voting time. They're all out in the streets and they're all fighting, punching each other, hitting, throwing things at each other. It's the damnedest thing you ever saw. <clears throat> but one night I had a match with him in some small ass downtown and they started throwing things and a piece of, I don't know. I want to say it's a look like shattered glass, like windshield glass hit me. And I said, screw this. And I left the ring. Oh, the next night the invader was coming dressed to him. Hey, Migo, why are you leaving me? Because he was going to beat me. And when I left, they just had to count me out. He didn't like that. And I told him, I said, well, let me tell you one thing. And I stood up to him. The last time he ever charged at me, I said, I'm not standing in the ring and being a target for these guys. And I said, I don't know why you're you're not siding with me because it could as easily have hit you. So I'm not doing it. So if you think, I said, I don't know why you didn't get out on the mic and tell people not to throw stuff. Because you'd have to tell them in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. So well, they've listened to but him. Did it? Oh, they would have listened to him because he was a he was like a national hero there. He was on TV there for ten years. <clears throat> That's why he wasn't convicted of the Brody murder because hmm. the people thought they knew him. And I've talked about this before on the show, and they thought that Brody was bullying him, and he had every right to defend himself. Even though the, that he took the knife into the shower with him, and they just, and he, invited him into the shower cubicle as well, invited him in there. And I have written. A, did I send you that story I wrote? Yeah. Well, uh, is this for the upcoming? Third I've book? thought about it for years and years and years, and my initial thoughts were: I don't think that Invader had had intended or had the intent <coughs> to kill Brody. But now thinking back on it, I think he did. And it has taken me, I don't know how long, 30 something years to come to that uh, revelation. But I do think he maybe not intended to really kill him, but to really hurt him. Mm. <coughs> and he hurt him badly and he killed him. So I think that's uh, why I w when they had the trial, the the jury only deliberated for like less than an hour. Then they came back and gave the verdict not guilty. That meant that all 12 jurors on that jury voted that he wasn't guilty. Mm -hmm. 
We crazy. We think. Uh, I think we'll probably do a full episode on Bruiser Brody. Uh, someone emailed me not too long ago saying it was uh, next month will be thirty five years. Yeah. Uh, since uh, since the murder, so uh, we'll probably uh, do something to coincide with that. Uh, as far as Invader goes, purely from a workmanship perspective, what was Invader like to wrestle? Shits. <laughs> Oh, you know, you want him to sell, and, you know, he didn't want to – he would always kick out at one early in the match, and then later, you know, he, he never would kick out at two and a half. Oh, no. He would always kick out at, like, one and a half because he had to always show the fans that he still had that strength to do it. Mm. <laughs> and people have told me that, even Puerto Ricans have told me that he spoke Spanish horribly. He was like a, for, for American people, he spoke English like maybe coal miners in West Virginia speak English or people in the deep South speak English because he spoke it in a country accent which made him sound, they said, stupid. I don't know how it made him sound, but even listening to it, and I didn't even understand Spanish. It didn't have a, a cadence to it, kind of. But and it's, he would always hold that fist up and the, pun, the punch, the pun, yeah, whatever he called it. So... But I never liked to work with him because it was going to either be his way or no way. So, and most of the time when I work, when I went back to book for the right before I went to IWA, I sent him a finish one night. It was TV. I sent him a finish one night. I give it to the referee, and he took it over. And referee come back about ten minutes. He said, "Dutch, I give finish to Invader." He said, "No." I said, "He said what?" He said, "No, give another finish." I went, "Well, okay." It's my it's like my first TV there. So, in the. Uh, just trying to get along, I send him another finish, which ends up in the same way, just a different way. And the referee comes back in about 10 minutes and he says, I give Invader other finish. He, he said, no, give another finish. Well, this time I was pissed off. I was pissed off the first time. Second time, I'm really pissed off. I said, no, you take this to Invader. You tell Invader to give me a finish. That ends up the same way, and we'll do that. But don't ever ask me to send you another finish because I'm not doing it. So, and from that point on, I never figured Invader in, in anything. He was just always the first and second match every night. Of course, I'd put him over, but I put him in matches that didn't mean anything because I wanted him to ask. What are you going to do with me? What do you? I need to do something. And it took about two months because he's a damn hardhead. And he come to me one day and he says, uh, Dutch, uh, what do you want to do with me? I went, well, if you'll do business, I can do something with you. But when you sent those finishes back that, that night, I, I'm done. But I was done with you. If you want to work, we can do something. If you don't, you're going to stay right where you are. And he never, he never threatened me with going to Carlos. If he had, I said, well, go to Carlos. I don't give a crap. He wants to get rid of you anyway. <laughs> I'll be just a way for him to dump you. <clears throat> but Invader, he, he drew a little money there, but he was more a pain in the ass than he was anything else. We have time for one more question. I'll ask you, I'll give you a couple of subjects. You tell me which one you think you got the best story for. Ockham Albrecht, a.k.a. Brackus in USWA, The Headbangers, 
uh, Danhausen. Uh, out of those three, have you got a story or an opinion? Yeah, what's that first one's name? Ockham Albrecht, a.k.a. Brackett. Shall I ask that one? Yeah, I asked that one. Okay, Davy Jones. Do you remember working with a bodybuilder in USWA called Ackham Albrecht, a.k.a. Brackus? He was a WWF pickup who Dr. Tom Pritchard was training in 1996, who was so brittle that they had to bring a mattress in for him to bump on. You know, I was I would be perfectly content and happy if I had never heard that word again, <laughs> Brockus. I don't even know what Brockus is. Is that a Roman character or something? Brockus, some big strong guy or God something? God knows. I, I'll, I'll I Google don't know. it, and if anything else apart from Ackham Albrecht comes in, then we'll know it means nothing. That guy was the worst. I'm saying in the ring, the worst. He was big and strong, and he'd walk to the ring. And... But this was his problem. He had a great body. He had no timing. He had no really athletic ability other than lifting weights. And that's all he had. I had this match with him, and he blew up totally within like five minutes. We hadn't done anything. And he was huffing, and he was puffing, and, <clears throat> and you could hear him sucking wind. <clears throat> so for him to get his breath back, I took over on him and was I was doing all the moves and he was still blown up, sit down. I'm giving him time to recover. So finally the time come after a minute or two for him to make his comeback. And he was so blown up. He was staggering and he swung a forearm that was supposed to be in my chest, hit me right in the face, almost knocked me out. Then he swung the other one and almost knocked me out again. I said, screw this. And I, I forgot what the finish was. I He either beat me or I beat him. I don't remember. But I don't, uh, whatever happened, I just wanted to get out of this misery. Because, like I said, you're like a doctor. Do no harm. And if you can't get in the ring after you're training for a couple of months and go five minutes without sucking wind, I mean, I wasn't in the greatest shape either. But I was damn sure a lot a better cardio shape than that guy was, and I wasn't even training at all. <clears throat> and so I forgot where he was from. I think he was German. I, was he German? No, he wasn't German. He was an American. I don't think he was German. But I, I'm trying to think. Um, oh, the, I no. think back. I think he ended up being a real life security guard. Yeah, he was German. A German match. personal trainer and former bodybuilder. My name was Brakos. Uh, he was horrible. <laughs> I could have went the rest of my life not ever hearing that name again. Because mm. he was the... I'd watch some of his matches and all the... Nobody else wanted to work with him either. So when I see my name on it, I would say, why don't I turn around and him let him just small package me? One, two, three. I love that finish. That was one of my finishes when I didn't want to work with somebody. I would say, beat me quick. That's an old wrestler's joke. You say, well, you can beat me, but do it quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to run around with you. I did. I didn't finish that, that quick finish with Scott Hall one night in Dothan. I told you that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was a big guy. He was smoking dope with Robert Fuller. I didn't know what kind of mood he'd be in. I said, I give him three finishes. And it'd take about eight minutes to get it in, but it was entertaining and he didn't hurt me. So did, did Dr. Tom, that's what veterans do. You figure out ways to not get hurt. <laughs> did Dr. Tom tell you about the whole mattress thing with, I didn't, Adam? he didn't tell me that. Uh, with uh, also, I, I, I'll ask this one brief thing and then we will close down. Did the WWF actually pay Jerry or Jerry, to take the waifs and strays of these WWF guys they'd sign and then never use and leave them in Memphis. Probably. Probably. And guess what Jerry did? He took the money and had us train them <laughs> in the ring. That's what I think happened. 
because uh, let's say he will get like, I don't know, 300 a month to train this guy. Well, Jerry never touched him. Jerry may have looked at him when he come in. I'm just saying. But I know wrestling promoters, if you got six guys, they're going to give you $1,800 a month and you don't have anything to do with it and you let your other talent, you know, and they're being paid off the house. So you're just making $1,800 just to create a place for them. <clears throat> Smart business. Mm -hmm. But I'm damn sure not going to go out there and train a guy that I'm not getting any money out of. Plus, has the ability or the likelihood of hurting me. Anybody that does that, they're not in their right mind. Because mm -hmm. I've often thought I wasn't in my right, right mind anyway for being in this business. <laughs> so... Dutch, uh, like a doctor says, uh, like the psychiatrist says, I'm afraid our time is up. <laughs> and like the doctor says, do no harm. Yeah. The Hippocratic Oath. Doctor also says, pay me as well, which should be the new catchphrase at the end of this podcast to remind me. It, it should be. Well, you reminded me last week. I did. I'm writing it down. Look, actually, I've written the word. Write it down again. I've written it. Hang on. I've actually written the wrong word down. I've written paid. Oh, so actually, that's paid? bad. Oh, okay, that is bad. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, I've sort of just assumed I have. So th done. this is okay. So if anybody wants a University of Dutch diploma, email me Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's, Gmail dot com. Ask me about it. I'll, I'll fill you in on it. And uh, it, it, same way with the books. If you want Tales from a Dirt Road, and uh, the world according to Dutch. Oh, that's it. I can't even remember my own books. The World According to Dutch. And uh, email me, Dirty Dutch Mantel. I'll, I'll get it to you. And I, I the last bunch of books I sent out, I've got to tell you the story. Okay. Something happened with my publisher. They the, the factory went on strike. And it took, I don't know, 10 days for them to come off strike. Then they got to print it. But that delayed my latest departure for two weeks. I hate that. I hate to promise somebody something and then not get it to them on a timely fashion. So I had a guy who wrote me. His name is Paul Hunt, and he is from Auckland, New Zealand. And he wanted two books, but it's international airfare. You know what it cost me, or it didn't cost me, it cost Paul. You know what it cost Paul to ship two signed copies of Tales from a Dirt Road and World According to Dutch? Tell me. And they're about, I guess they're almost like two pounds a piece, maybe. You know what it cost me to, to, to send those books to, to Auckland, New Jersey? Uh, more than here? $58. These two books. Oh, they're great books. I Sometimes I sit down and I read it and I actually forget that I've, I've written it. I know how it ends, but I can read it myself because it doesn't take a lot to, to amuse me. So, but, and I had one more thing I wanted to say. I have heard, this is news. Mm -hmm. some news on Jerry Lawler you know his recent stroke that he had in February that put him in the hospital almost killed him and he's had some more mini strokes along the way and I don't think he is he is much better but still <clears throat> not recovering as well as they would hope. He has trouble finishing sentences. I mean, he talks well. His voice, is, his voice has changed somewhat, but he talks, but when he gets to the end of the sentence, he starts searching for words to end the sentence, and he gets frustrated, but, and he's, he's an artist, but he's having trouble with his right hand. I think because I think he had it on the 
strokes are odd mm. on the left side of the body. Yeah, you have it on one side of your brain, and then it affects the other side of the body. It affects it? the other side. So I think he had it on his left side. He's right-handed. He has trouble now doing his art, which is really frustrating him because he was a true, and he still is probably, a tremendous artist, but he is he is not where he needs to be. That's why he wasn't uh, live at WrestleMania. He wasn't cleared to he wasn't cleared to travel. No, th so th they've been they've been saying that um, <clears throat> maybe some people were a bit optimistic there, saying, "Oh, well, he could be back on Raw doing commentary in a month." But strokes aren't an exact science as far as a I'm timeline. I'm going to recovery. say that, that that I think we've seen him on his last Raw. If there is any, and I hope I'm wrong, I'm hope I'm wrong, but if there's any indication that he may not be able to do it, if there's like a 5% chance that something might happen, he's not doing it. Because if something happened on Raw, you imagine how, how badly Raw would get roasted for having him on there after having those strokes? I'm saying, I don't know. I hope, you know, Jerry, we have the same birthday, same year, same day. I say that all the time. I used to call him my cosmic brother, but I hope he gets better and uh, I hope he's okay. Can I ask the source of this information or is this confidential? No, you no, you may not. Oh, okay, then. I, well, I, I will not ask then. We, we just know that the source is true. Well, I trust the source is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I will then close down this podcast. If nothing, if nothing else, my uncle's tried to ring me four times in a row, and I keep hanging up uh, on him. So he clearly okay. wants – so I think he's absolutely desperate for a lift somewhere, which I believe is – Okay. <laughs> that's generally why he calls me more than once. He's T desperate. Tell to him to take an Uber. God, he's too cheap for that. Well, when you've got – that's what family are for. That's the free Uber. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well – Good show today, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. I thought even better. We we raise the bar every week, Dutch. How far have we? How long has the uh, podcast gone? Well, um, it was one hour forty five, and then uh, we went into the Jerry Lawler news. So it's a few minutes over that. But I will okay. shut down this podcast now. Thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you again next week, Dutch. I'll try not to draw pen all over my t shirt while I do this. We the people. We the people, the University of Dutch awaits you.